All right, thank you. Hello, folks. Good morning. So my name is Shishal, representing the Gorilla Project. I thought what might be interesting is, is the mic not on? Okay, it is. All right. What might be interesting is for me to present the vision of where, you know, we see function calling going. And then I'll present some recent highlights. And the Gorilla Project has actually grown on to have a life of its own. So there's more work around function calling, tool use, so on and so forth. Uh, so we'll go through the entire process. But let's start off with the vision, right? So why are we doing it? If you look at the world today, uh, you can think of it in the following sense. I have all your favorite LLMs on one side, right? You can also um, have subscription to one or many of these. And then I have the whole digital world on the other side uh, to your right. Now, the way you prompt an LLM today is you go ahead. Uh, interesting. Okay. So you prompt the LLM, you get a response, but it's then up to you as the user to then take this response and then perform an action on the rest of the world and get a feedback, right? So for example, if I want to install CUDA on my machine, then I prompt ChatGPT, how do I install CUDA? It gives me a bunch of Linux instructions. Then I need to go ahead and deploy these instructions on my command line and then get a response, which might be that the CUDA is installed on your machine. Same with Adobe, same with all the other tools that you use. Now, our goal was the following, right? Can we flip this around? Can we have a scenario where the LLM is the one that performs all the actions. And to do that, we train the Gorilla LLM. So the goal here is that you prompt the LLM. The LLM performs an action. And then it relays the artifact back to you. Right? And why is this interesting? Well, this is based on this you know, fundamental belief that humans are good discriminators and LLMs are good generators. So if I give you two recipes for a cake and I ask you which recipe do you like more, it's very hard for you to tell without knowing what the cake is. But if I give you two pieces of cake uh, from, you know, two different recipes, you can very quickly tell me which one you like better, right? So similarly, if there's a big SQL database and then you want to plot, say, a graph out of this. Now, if I want to tell you which graph do you like, which color scheme do you like, it's very hard for you to imagine that as opposed to if I were to give you the two graphs and ask you which one do you like, right? So humans are good discriminators, LLMs are good generators. So let us, the LLM, to perform the action and the humans can just go ahead and discriminate what's going on. So that's the key idea, right? Now, this is all a little too abstract, I understand. So let me ground this with a concrete example, right? So many of us are machine learning researchers, and there's one thing we need all the time, which is GPUs. Now, suppose you were to go and say, hey, you know, can I get an 800 GPU in East US? There's a few things we want the LLM to do, right? The first is acknowledge that East US is how Azure names its regions. It's US East 1A in AWS, so on and so forth. So this is going to be an Azure view of the digital world, right? I care about all Azure services. So there's reasoning involved. Now, once we identify that this is Azure, the next thing that we want to do is actually go ahead. And as retail customers, you might have quotas, right? So do you have enough GPUs in this particular region or not? So you identify this region. So there's a lot of back and forth that the LLM does with the service provider, a hyperscaler Azure in this case. And then you actually instantiate the GPU, right? And then you pass that artifact back to the user. And the artifact could be like an SSH logging credential uh, or a team obsession, whatever, right? So that's the key idea here. Can the user come up with an intent? The LLM will do the reasoning and perform the action and then relay that artifact back to you. So you can just discriminate whether you like the action or you don't. Um, and to do that, you know, we have to support a bunch of services. And today, the whole Gorilla ecosystem supports about 60,000 uh, different services. This includes all your hyperscalers like AWS, GCP, Azure, Salesforce, ServiceNow, Datadog. Um, of course, all the machine learning APIs, Stripe, ID, and so on and so forth. And a few things that I want to highlight is, you know, this is not... So Gorilla as a community is, is Apache 2 licensed and open source, right? So we're running this out of Berkeley. So everything that we have is accessible to everyone uh, easily. And then you can contribute your own APIs. Uh, if you find something is buggy, you can go ahead and fix that. And then, you know, we train the models constantly uh, with this set of APIs that the community develops. Okay, so this is the vision. Uh, and I'll also quickly show you a little bit uh, on the demo. But to do this, we had to answer a few interesting research questions, right? And so let me quickly walk you through one such question that we had to answer uh, in building this model. The first question we wanted to ask was, how much does GPT-4 hallucinate, right? Now, if I were to ask this question, you know, I need to caveat this by saying that hallucination is very ill-defined in the general purpose scenario, right? So for example, if I ask, when was Michael Jordan born? Is it Michael Jordan, the basketball player? 
or is it Michael Jordan, the professor of machine learning at Berkeley? So it's very hard to discern, right, uh, without clear intent. But I claim that this is not true in the case of APIs and services, right? And this is based on this fundamental belief that the set of services or APIs that a provider gives you is fixed given a snapshot in time. Across time, it may vary, but over time, it's fixed, right? So let's take Mistral as an example. You know, they have a set of APIs. Now, today, you cannot will an API into existence. The set of APIs you have is fixed. So can we use this for grounding, right? So let's take an example. Uh, I'll walk you through it. So this is a simple, you know, PyTorch machine learning API load, right? So there's Torch of load. I'm trying to get a TensorNet one-to-one model. So this is a Pythonic API call. You can have RESTful API calls, uh, bash command lines, et cetera, right? The first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to build a syntax tree out of this. And then I ask a simple question, is this syntax tree a proper subset of all APIs that PyTorch gives you or not? And if it is, then I claim it's not hallucination. I make no comment on accuracy. I just claim it's not hallucination, right? And there's a distinction between the two. So for example, if I want to send my friend $100, I ask the LLM, hey, I want to send $100 to my friend. What do I do? If the LLM tells me use Venmo or PayPal API, that's accurate, right? I can actually send money to someone using Venmo or PayPal. Right? But if the LLM told me, you know, why don't you use this dot hub load API? You can't really send money. So it's not accurate. It's also not hallucinated, right? Because this API exists. You can think of hallucination as would it give you a 404 if it's a RESTful API call or would you get a stack trace if it's Python or C++, right? Except it's, you know, if the LLM were to say, hey, why don't we use something like a Berkeley API? Now, Berkeley does not have any API service, right? So that's clearly hallucinated. And so that's how we distinguish. Accuracy is when it does what you want it to do. Hallucination is when it performs something. And this is, you know, slightly tricky because often human intent is not very clear. And then you have, uh, you have, you know, it's absolutely hallucinated, but the API does not exist at all. And so using this, we were actually able to, you know, pull classical concepts from literature called the abstract syntax tree. So this is just an abstract syntax tree, right? That many of you might have learned in your undergrad CS courses. So by using this abstract syntax tree, we can actually go ahead and measure hallucination for the LLM in this domain of function calling and tool use, right? So plugins goes by many names. Okay, so we did this, and this was a gorilla paper. So when we released the paper, the goal was, can you fine tune an LLM for your particular set of APIs? And we give you a recipe on how to do that. But increasingly, people want to do zero shot function calls, right? So this is a classic tool use of function use scenarios. And so to do that, we also train something called the open functions v2 model. And this is today the state of the art open source Apache 2 license model to do function calling. And there's a few interesting things that we did, right? One of which was, can we support more native data types? If you look at how function calling is done by classical providers today, you, your entire function has to be a JSON schema. And in JSON, your data types can be either number or integer. Now, if I have a function that says I want to calculate the interest rate um, you know, on, on a mortgage, should the response for the interest rate be 5 or should it be 0 0.05? Is it 5% or is it the rate uh, in integers, sorry, in absolute value 0 0.05? A lot of questions like this become extremely tricky if you do not have support for more data types. On the other hand, if I also had float, then I could tell you, right? If it's a float data type, then it's 0 0.05. If it's an int, then it's probably five, so on and so forth. So that's what we want to do, right? React runs the modern web. There's a lot of JSON, except JavaScript, et cetera. Can we support all of that? And not only do we have a model a horse in the race, but what we have also done is gone ahead and built uh, what we call the Berkeley function calling leaderboard. So this is the, all right, let's try to find the mouse pointer. No. Okay, excellent. So on over here, what we do is we try to benchmark different models on how they perform on function calling. And one of the unique things is this is not a static benchmark, right? So we actually deploy this and execute the API calls. So one of the API calls is what's the stock price of Tesla, right? Using Rapid API and Yahoo Finance. And we check and different models actually go ahead and give you the stock price when you, you know, want to trigger the APIs. And so you have most of the, you know, providers here. Uh, interestingly, a lot of the times, if you're trying to do API calling, function calling, you also care about cost and latency, right? Not just the mean or the standard deviation, you, but you also care about what's your P95 latency. So we also measure all of those things to help you uh, pick the right models for function calling, so on and so forth. And like I said, uh, this somewhere here, you should also find 
Gorilla Open Functions V2, which is one of our function calling models. Anyway, so I wanted to highlight this. And then in the next few minutes, what I'm going to do is walk you through, you know, where we are with the project and also where, where we want to head forth. So the first is Gorilla today is already had wide impact. A lot of thought leaders in the field have acknowledged this as a step in the right direction. There's a healthy open source community. We have been in the popular press, both domestic and international. And, you know, there's a lot of collaboration, especially on the Berkeley function calling leaderboard with a lot of um, frontier labs out there. Not just that, uh, you know, we are an academic institution, so we don't really go ahead and build products, but we have partnered with Microsoft and Azure. So you can use a lot of the models that we built and the recipes to train your own models, either through uh, Microsoft, this was an announcement at Build, or um, using some of the Lava models through Meta as well. Okay. So this is the high level ecosystem, just to give you a picture. Now, our next focus uh, is the following, right? Today, a lot of people are using function calling where you, you know, you, you ask the LLM to come up with a function, you can use it in agentic scenarios, so on and so forth. One of the questions we want to ask is, can we build a runtime to actually execute the actions that your LLM generates, right? So if you have a coding model, can you actually execute the code that your LLM generates? And of course, I mean, it's not hard for me to convince you why this could be tricky, right? If you're having arbitrary code that's being generated. Uh, so one example to highlight this is the following, right? So suppose you have the Amazon shopping cart example. You know, there's a bunch of people uh, who are trying to interact with the service. This is a bunch of microservices talking to each other through gRPC or SQL API calls. And it's not, you know, too much of a stretch to say in the future, one or all of these microservices is going to be powered by LLMs. Now, what could go wrong? All of it, right? You're having an undeterministic system inside a very trusted uh, workflow. And the problem is when you're unhappy with something, you only get to know the downstream scenario. And second, it's a delayed response. Right? It's only when you get something you don't like into your house do you know that you know one microservice screwed up. So the problems are if you're trying to build agents with these LLMs in write plus read scenarios, you have delayed verification and only downstream outcome is visible. What we want to do, and this is called the GoX project, is to say, can we guarantee reversibility for certain actions? Right? So you have an agent uh, that's you know acting on your behalf. Suppose you're traveling and you say, hey, agent, can you send an email to my next meeting that I'm going to be late by five minutes? The problem is certain times this can be recovered. Like if it's a Slack message, you can always delete the Slack message, but not everything can be undone. Like what, what happens if you send an email, right? That email is gone. So you can't undo it. So the, so the trick that we have is can we use the dual guarantees of, you know, both undo semantics and blast radius confinement, right? So the agent performs an action. You don't like the action. Can you undo it? Well, what about actions that you cannot undo? Like if you send money to someone. In those cases, if you are the director or the manager, can you assign a dollar cost value? Can you say every time my agent performs an action, be it for first party internal users or third party users, it should not cost more than five cents of total accrued value, right? So can you come up with these dollar cost specifications so we can then take that and distill that into policies that we can then enforce with the LLM, right? So that's, that's the key idea here. In short, think of this as, you know, as you try to build agents and workflows, can we build an insurance mechanism for all of these agents, right? Not just for read, but like read act, uh, write actions, you know, performing uh, all the different scenarios that you want to alter in the digital ecosystem. And like, you know, most other Berkeley projects, GoX is also open sourced. Uh, so this is something that you can also go ahead and check out today. Okay, so with that, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to conclude my part of the talk where I presented Gorilla and we spoke about how to measure hallucination. Uh, we, I didn't really go into RAT in the interest of time, but we actually took RAT and built that into a much more general purpose raft uh, setting, which Deandre will be talking about next. And then I showed you some examples of the Berkeley function calling leaderboard and the GoX ecosystem as well. Thank you very much. I think we have time for maybe one or two questions and then we'll break for a little bit. Um, so, any questions? So, the versatility part, um, can we look into existing conditions like one, um, which is if you look for some more of the like, and it's not, or if it stays back in the state. 
Yeah, yeah. So that's a good question. To repeat the question is, you know, have you looked into temporal and other reversibility uh, solutions? The answer is yes. We have looked at it from an underlying technology perspective, right? So if you have a database, independent of which service provider gives you, the way you get reversible transactions in databases through the transaction semantics, right? You can either commit the transaction or you can abort the transaction. And similarly, in file systems, there are techniques where you can perform uh, a particular operation on a virtual file system, maybe in a Docker mounted, and then you can commit that or revert it. So we have looked at it from a fundamental perspective, and that helps us be tractable. But right? otherwise, you're building dependencies on top of different uh, service providers. We were like, can we go from a bottom up approach? That way, you can tackle more solutions. So the answer is yes. Uh, we look at all existing solutions and we employ that to perform, right? The tricky part is when you go into hosted services like Gmail, right? If you delete an email, the only way you can make that reversible is if you keep a copy locally and then you delete the one that you have so the information is available. But if you keep doing this and you're building folks of the universe every time you perform an action, so how do you, you know, carefully manage state? Uh, how do you manage space? Thank you very much. Uh, more. Thanks for a great talk. Uh, I wanted to know more about the retrieval where training. I think uh, that was something that was said in the range of the way of but the retrieval marks would be very interesting. Yeah, yeah. So the idea is the following, right? At, at a high level, if you use retrievers, your retrievers are inaccurate. Well, the tech, I mean, you look at recall. So your recall at K is never uh, 100%. So the point here is can you make the LLM double check what your retriever gave you? Like you ask a question, your retriever, you know, BM25, state of the art, what have you, is going to give you a bunch of documents. Can the LLM cross check and say, hey, this is actually relevant, this is actually not relevant? Right? So if you ask, when, is, when was Michael Jordan's birthday? And if the LLM gave you a document on the basketball player, and if the LLM gave you a document on Michael Jordan, the professor at Berkeley, then you want the LLM to make this one bit information is relevant or not. Right? So we use this in the training phase itself. Can you make the LLM robust to low quality retrievers? And so we did this with the API scenario, and Tiagun is going to be talking next on how do you generalize this to much more broader, like you know, medical documents, legal documents, so on and so forth. Yeah.